And uh, if you're new to Family Church, we are a video church, which means we have two other campuses which mostly get their messages via video from this campus. So about once a quarter, at least at this point, we are allowing you to experience the same thing. And Pastor Will was here last night, and we rocked it off, and he got a chance to do the message. And uh, so he is down in green, but we are going to watch him on video. And this is the beginning of a brand new series. And it's going to be a stretching series for us, because we're going to be spending some of the summer walking through the Old Testament prophets. And it's not necessarily something that you're super familiar with, but it's an important part of understanding God's heart and Israel's history. And we certainly get the idea that God is not casual about spiritual adultery. And when people are worshiping idols instead of worshiping God, God gets cranked up about it. And so it gives us a powerful window into the the character of God. And so we are going to be starting with uh, a young man named Ezekiel who has been hauled away in exile and he's trying to explain to God's chosen people why they've had the, the consequences, the difficulties they've had in their life. So listen carefully as Pastor Will takes us through the first part of Ezekiel. So anytime you look at a warning sign, how many of you are the people that when you buy something, you read the warning? Raise your hand. I have no idea what you guys are doing with that. Like, I just, I see no point in it. You know, uh, there are some things in life where you, you should read the warning because it's really important. There are other things, you can tell it's not a flotation device, you don't need to read the warning. We actually saw one, warning, ladder does not work underwater. Well, at some point, someone put their ladder in the pool and tried to use it, and then they had to put a warning for it. Some of them are just foolish. Some of them are obvious. If you ever see the black cat with the white stripes and the big bushy tail, what do you do when you see this kind of cat? You run the other way. I don't know if it's been this way for you in your life. I, I have a family member um, that when, when he saw the little cat with the black fur and the white fluffy tail, decided to chase after it. And we've had a smell around our house for the last six days because this little guy, Scout, decided it would be a wonderful thing to chase. There's a warning. It's a skunk. Don't go after it. Well, how do you hear a warning and actually heed the warning and make an alteration to your life? My life would have been much better if dear little Scout had simply ignored the skunk and stayed on his own area. So as we're looking at Ezekiel, I want to give you some concept of where we're going to be in the timeline of the Bible. If we have Abraham, he's about 1,800 years before Jesus. We're going to look at this in about 600 years before Jesus, okay? So Israel has split into two, and so the northern kingdom, which is known as Israel, has broken away, and they have already gone through the process of warning, sin, consequence, restoration, warning, sin, consequence, restoration. They've already been through this. And now the southern kingdom, Judah, which is the main kingdom that we're looking at, that actually this is the one that the line of Jesus comes through, they're in for it now too. And when you get to uh, 856, or 586 BC, this is when Israel um, has broken away and Judah has their problem and Jerusalem falls. Specifically in this era, one of the things I hadn't really realized is that three of our main characters, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel, all lived at the same time and were all dealing with the same issue. Judah was not following God, and all of them were called to be a warning towards Judah. And I don't know if you do this, but do you ever think that all of these people lived down the street from each other? But in actuality, there's some distance between them. Luke, who wrote about Jesus, never actually met Jesus. But then sometimes you'll have Isaiah and you think, well, Isaiah and Daniel, they're probably pretty close. And in actuality, they were about 200 years apart. But these three guys, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel, all lived at the same time. Which means when you read these three books, read with an understanding that the three of them are all dealing with the same issue. Which means some of the characters are going to be the same. In fact, on your outline, if you flip it over, there's some terms you're going to need to know moving forward for tonight. One of them is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was what I would call an evil king. And he was what God used in the life of Judah to teach them his lessons. He is the king of Babylon. 
He was ruthless, he was powerful, and he was coming after Judah. And when he gets a hold of them, God uses him to help their hearts go, oh my, this isn't working for us. So first off, you see Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon. The next thing you're going to need to know is the, the term exile. Exile is being removed from the place where you are. And God saying, mm, there's a problem. Usually it's a forced migration. Israel, or I um, uh, should say Judah, was forced out of Jerusalem. And everyone who had any type of skill or known intelligence was taken out of Judah and brought all the way across uh, the peninsula up to Babylon where they would be servants of Nebuchadnezzar. The reason they were sent into exile is because of the sins that they committed. This is part of the consequence. And the third thing that I want you to see, we have Nebuchadnezzar, exile, and the final one is a prophet. A prophet, there's two types of prophet. One of them is when you make more money at the end of a transaction. That's with an F. P-R-O-F. I-T, thank you, man. I-T, okay, I can't spell. Prophet with a P-H is a man, it's a person or a woman, man or woman that God is using to speak a warning. Okay, so when you write this uh, next to prophet, write the word warning. Write the word warning. So the way we're going to do this is each week we're going to help you understand the whole of the story of Ezekiel. Uh, or whatever uh, book we're going to do. And as we do that, we're going to give you two weeks of it, but we're going to nail down into two specific um, chapters, one each week. So a little background for you on who Ezekiel was. Ezekiel, living in, uh, in Jerusalem, was taken in the exile and ended up in Babylon. And while he was there, five years in, God laid on his heart, I have some things for you to speak to the people of Judah. You need to speak on behalf of me the truth that I have, that they have chosen other gods and they have sinned against me. But interestingly enough, he wasn't a prophet until five years into his time there. One of the things that you'll notice as you're reading Ezekiel is that Ezekiel is one that God uses a lot of very descriptive, um, he puts Ezekiel into the story. One of the things that he asks him to do, he says, I want you to take human excrement and cook food over it as a sign so that when people ask you about it, you can tell them what I'm doing. Another time, he, God said, I want you to take all your clothes off. That's just weird. But in the process of this, it drew attention, and then he was able to say, here is the warning. One of the saddest ones is in chapter 24, and you're going to read this in your weekly devotions that are on the back of your outline. In 24, God says at the beginning of the chapter, hey, you know your wife that you love? By the end of the, end of the day, she's going to die. And what I want you to do is I want you to not mourn. I don't want you to put on the clothes. I don't want you to listen to the songs. That, I don't want you to mourn at all. And here's why, because Israel, Judah, is about to go through the exact same thing, and when it does, they're going to be called to that as well. So when we're going to be in uh, chapter 20, we'll pick it up right there uh, in Babylon, where Ezekiel has a group of elders come to him, and they say, we want you to inquire of the Lord for us. You see, oftentimes when people are moving away from God, there is still some connection that they have with God. And they say, hey, let's ask Ezekiel what God says we should do. And when he gets there, God's response is a little bit of, are you kidding me? Okay, if you've ever been a parent of a teenager, you have the same attitude that God had right here. The elders come and say, hey, uh, can, can you tell us what's going on? And God was like, are you kidding me? Your teenager flunks a test and then asks for the car keys. Say it with me. Are you kidding me? There's no way. And so in, in, in the process of this, God spends the first half of the chapter until verse 24 explaining how stupid you are. Okay, explaining what was it they did to move away. And this is where you're going to find the warning. One of the things I saw in this, and we're going to pick this up in verse 27. Watch carefully some of the background that Ezekiel gives. This is in, uh, starting in verse 7. And I said to them, this is Ezekiel saying to those elders, Each of you get rid of the vile images that you have set your eyes on, and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. This is where it goes on. He's talking about Judah and Israel all the way back when they were in Egypt and when they were in captivity. So we're talking, this is a, hundreds and hundreds of years later. And he's telling them, you guys have had this problem all along. You have rebelled against constantly. When they were in Egypt, they were worshiping the idols that the Egyptians had. But they rebelled against me and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile images they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and send, uh, send my anger against them in Egypt. 
but for the sake of my name, I brought them out of Egypt. You know what? Here's something I'd never seen before until I was reading Ezekiel this specific time. Whenever I read Exodus, I always thought that the problem of not following God started after they were gone. It actually, what we find out here is in Ezekiel, he's saying all the way back then, there was already this problem. They were living in Egypt as slaves. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. And God said to him, God said to them, I am so frustrated, I'm, I'm ready to be done with it. But he had already said all the way back with Abraham, when I told Abraham, I'm going to draw them out of slavery, I, I have to follow my, because I've said it for the sake of my name, I had to bring them out. But I want you to see this. The idea of looking away from God and following another God other than the one who created them and who drew them and who chose them is not a new problem. This goes all the way back to, to the very beginning, all the way back to when they were slaves in Egypt. This is a perpetual problem. In fact, when they get out into the wilderness, Abraham goes up on Mount Sinai where God gives him the Ten Commandments. While he's up there, Paul told a story a couple weeks ago, while he's up there, the people of Israel make a golden calf. You know what was worshipped in Egypt? I'll give you one guess. Golden calves. And they were drawing back to what they had learned all the way back when they were in Egypt. This problem was on and on. And you'll see this throughout their, their life. The life cycle of Israel and Judah. They would follow God and then they would get distracted. There would be a warning and a heavy consequence. And then they would repent and they would turn over and over. But understand this. This goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. All the way back to when they were in Egypt. And as we're looking at this, this perpetual problem... I want you to look at when we um, take apart uh, Ezekiel 20. I want you to listen carefully. What was the sin that was heavy on them? Because what you're going to see is there's a breaking of trust. The God in his gracious love connected with them and said, you are going to be mine. But because of their actions, a continual split um, happens. It's a perpetual problem. You know, uh, when I was saying how Moses was up on Mount Sinai and how God had given him the Ten Commandments, those are the, the, basically the linchpin of everything that's important. And I was looking at that, and I was looking at Exodus, or, I mean, Ezekiel 20, and I noticed that one of them stood out in particular, specifically the one that we had just talked about, the idea of the golden calf or the idols that were in Egypt. Number two, you shall, make, you shall not make for yourself an idol well, right away, these people begin having that problem. It says it in verse 20. And I said to them, each of you get rid of the vile images you have set your eyes on and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Notice this. The first problem in the breaking of trust was their, their perpetual problem of saying, yeah, I, I see that God, you created us and I know you drew us out. And I know you called us, but we would really rather follow an idol. And I have to say, all growing up, I thought this was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. So you take a piece of stone or a piece of wood, you carve it, and then you cover it with gold, and then you bow down and worship it. You are the one that made it. Why in the world would you think this way? But let me give you some clarity because it seems like something that we would have no— Raise your hand if you've ever worshipped an idol. Yep. Yeah, me either, right? Okay, so this entire book means nothing to us, right? Not so fast. Let me bring some clarity, a little historical background that will help you understand why this was so tempting. And we might evaluate our own lives and find this is not so far from us. So I actually um, brought an idol myself. So <laughs> the bobblehead for you. So the idea of the idol was that it usually centered around one specific issue. It centered around fertility. And the idea was if I worship this idol, you've ever heard, you've heard of fertility gods? Almost every idol that you see in scripture, almost all of them had to do with if I worship them, it would help me in fertility. Now, some of you are thinking, wow, this is all about having babies, partly. But really, this is all economics because you wanted fertility for money in two ways. One of them, the more kids you had, the better your farm could be. Because this is an agrarian economy. Here's the other one. If you have a fertility God, this is Chris Mullins, by the way, old school warriors. If you trusted in the great idol of Chris Mullins and you decided that you were going to put your trust in, he would help you with your crops. 
Now listen carefully. When we think of an idol covered in gold with a little bobblehead and we think, how stupid were those people? They were so uninformed. We would never. The heartbeat of idol worship was so that their, heart, so that their money would be okay. This idol worship is a trust issue. So let me ask again. Have you ever struggled with idol worship? Let's raise our hands again. Pastor Paul has his hand up. Look over here, sinner. By the way, if you ever are going to preach and you need to borrow money, borrow from Paul. He doesn't carry ones. He carries tens. It's great. Okay. The idea being, though, this is an idol. So is this. In fact, I want to play this out because this is ultimately, this is ultimately a trust issue. And when you look at the Bible and you say, this doesn't really apply to me. These guys are worshiping golden calves and stuff. I would never. The underlying heartbeat, the universal principle that comes down and is still true for us is that can I trust God? Or do I trust money? And let's play this out. I want you to imagine that we're going to give a check to all of you for $10,000. Just play that out. And in your own mind, would you feel more secure if you had a check for $10,000? I'll shoot straight with you. I definitely would. Because $10,000 would cover a lot of medical bills. And $10,000 could be a nice addition to the house. $10,000 would help with a car. That'd be a nice upgrade. Would it be nice? Would you feel more secure if you had a check for $10,000? Most of us, if we're honest and if we're going to be transparent, are going to say, yeah, yeah, I'm down. I'm in with that. Now I want you to compare that. You can get a check for $10,000. Just feel that. Or you can hear that God loves you and has a plan for your life and that he will care for you. And I'll be honest with you. I know what I'm supposed to say because we're in church. I would be over here, but it's not true. It's hard to trust God. It's hard not to say, no, I'll take the money. But here's the echo thing out, and here's what you have to begin seeing, and why we want you to be reading Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Isaiah. Because throughout, there's universal principles that are still echoing true today. What do you trust? Because if it's God, your life will look very different than if it's Paul's money. Okay? Idol, number one. When we're looking at this, if you look through... Um, verse 20, or verse 4 through 24, in those 20 verses, there are 11 mentions of vile images and, um, and idol worship. He says, this is a problem. Whenever you're reading the Bible, always look for what is the repeated phrase? What is the repeated issue over and over again? What is that thing that we see again and again and again? Because there's more to it than this, though. Verses 4 through 11 really centers on this. But he comes back around and says, there's another trust issue that I have with you. It's not just that you were worshiping an idol, hoping that it will care for you in a way that I won't. Can you imagine how this must break God's heart? I offer you connection, relationship, protection, and life. What, what, what do I need from you? Connection back. And they say, yeah, I get that you created the universe, but look at this really cool idol. It could probably provide for me better. And one of the ways that this plays out comes with another one of those Ten Commandments that they did not follow. See, there's the, the idol worship. And this one surprised me. It's number four. It's the Sabbath. In fact, we were um, having a conversation about the sermon series, and there was four of us sitting at a coffee shop. And I happened to be just flipping through. And I had read this over and over again and had not seen this. But I was flipping through it, and I saw the word Sabbath. And I thought that was so interesting that they would mention Sabbath. Because Sabbath is, has two purposes. One of them, it forces you to rest and it gives you opportunity to worship. And this is what God said. He said, I want you to have a Sabbath as a sign so that you, all the people will know, all the other nations will know, no, 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 you're mine. Do you realize how stupid a Sabbath is on purely economic terms? Every single person in Israel and in Judah, all of them lived in an agrarian economy, which means all of them were farmers or ranchers. So, some of you city folk are not going to get this, but raise your hand if you've ever lived on a farm or a ranch. Okay, you guys get this. You know what there's always more of? Work. This is taking a day and not working. 
economically speaking, stupid. But this is how God says, he says two things. One, am I worth your time for worship and rest? And more than that, do you trust me? Do you see the difference in idol worship versus worshiping God? See, idol worship, you, you worship them and they will give you lots of kids and you will have a lot of um, healthy crops. And God says, trust me, take a day off so that you can spend time with me, connect with me. These are two drastically different mindsets. One of them says, I have to protect. I have to make sure that I am covering all of my economic bases. And the other says, God, I'm in with you and I trust you. So the first one I see in there is, is, um, is idols, but Sabbath, it actually comes up six times in 12 verses over and over. Remember, what are we looking for? The repeated phrase. What is the problem? What, what comes up over and over and over again? One, two, three, four, five, six. It continues saying, this is really important. So here's what we have. The first half is to say, here's why you won't hear from me because of these two actions that ultimately center on this. Because your heart doesn't trust me. You would rather worship Chris Mullins and the bobblehead. You would rather say that little piece of stone or wood covered in gold. That's what's gonna bring you fertility. That's what's gonna bring you economic prosperity. And you won't follow the sign that I gave that said, take the day off and spend it with me. Connect with me. You won't. And here's what's gonna happen. You're already paying for it. In fact, when we pick this story up, they're mid-consequence. But I want you to see the beauty of God's grace because this is not how the chapter ends. The first 24 verses paint a very grim picture of the choices that Judah has made. But it doesn't end with this. Watch what it says. We're going to look at the rebuilding of faith. The first step in rebuilding of the faith comes with a warning. And I hadn't thought of this before, but you know what a warning is? It's actually a, a piece of grace. It's a gift. In fact, next to this on your outline, I want you to write the word gift. They didn't earn this. This is God Almighty, creator of the universe, who drew them out of Egypt. They have screwed up. And yet God in his graciousness is willing to give a warning. The natural way that things work is when you mess up, you pay the price. I love it when it's a natural consequence. Uh, I remember playing basketball, getting frustrated. Um, I, I kept shooting and it wouldn't go in. And I was so mad. I just decided I was going to slam that ball down. I was going to teach that ball a lesson. Slam that ball right down. And all of that force went into that ball. It shot right back up and hit me in the face. The natural move of my anger led right back to the, the smack in my face. But here's what God does. He says, your action... I'm actually going to give you the gift of a warning. Watch what he does here. Look at the grace in this. And I, I want you to see this through the lens of grace. They did not earn this. You say, we want to be like the other nations, like the people of the world who serve wood and stone. But what have you in mind? But what you have in mind will never happen. Hey, you can go ahead and do that. It's never going to work. And he gives the caution and the warning. The second aspect of this, and I would say this is also a gift, is that a consequence is actually a gift. One of the things I've noticed about God throughout all of scripture is that God is not a helicopter parent. Helicopter parents are those parents who come in, they make a lot of noise, they make a lot of wind, and they try and rescue. In fact, uh, we teach a parenting class called Love and Logic, and uh, on night one, we talk about different types of parents, and I've just noticed this is so far from the way that God functions because God always allows the consequences to be a part of it, part of growing his people. So this is one of the scenarios we say, let's just imagine that your kid, your little Johnny, and he's about two and a half years old, he climbs up on top of a stool. Now what may happen if Johnny falls off? He, yeah, he's gonna get hurt. Check around, make sure that the floor won't be damaged, okay? But here's the scenario we give. If Johnny gets up there, if you're a helicopter parent, you know what you want to do? Race in, warning, and grabbing and saying, no, no, don't do that. Now, here's what's interesting. I don't see God functioning that way. He allows the consequences to do the yelling so he doesn't have to. 
So when they climb up there, here's the way we teach in the parenting class, is you give a little advice. Hey, Johnny, um, can I give you a piece of advice? You see how you're up here? You see the floor is down there? If you fall, you might get hurt. Now, if it's, they're not going to break anything, this is what you do next. Dear God, I pray that they would fall. You know, some of you are like, you are the worst parent ever. Here, here's part of why. You see, when the kid falls off, here's what they learn. They learn that when there's a warning, which the parent just gave, there's a consequence. They learn that the parent is a genius. You know, wow, that dad knows everything. The other thing is that when you get up high and you fall down, it hurts, which is a natural consequence. And I tell you, I don't see God racing in with all of the wind and saying, stay away from my kids. He lets them make choices. He gives them warnings, but he lets them live in the consequences. Watch what it says here, where he plays this out. I will bring you into the wilderness of the nations, and there, face to face, I will execute judgment upon you. As I, what's the next word? Judge your ancestors in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will He's not going to let it go. The consequences are real. I will execute judgment. I will judge them before, and I will judge you. The choices you make, quote Shakespeare here for a second, the choices you make dictate the life you lead. Yep, no kidding. That's exactly right. You did this, and it got you here. But again, the chapter doesn't end here because there's a beautiful flow throughout Scripture where God, yes, has the line and holds it, and yes, consequences follow after the warning and the poor choice. But God is so gracious. And I want you to see how he responds in the verses 40 and 42. He responds with relationship. And as you, as you look at this, I actually want to do something a little different. As, as I'm going to put the scripture up there. I want you to, through the lens of relationship, I want you to see what's in there before I tell you anything. I just want you to read this. As I'm reading it out loud, look for the aspects of relationship. For on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord, there in the land, of, um, the land all the people of Israel will serve me, and there I will accept them. There I will require your offerings and your choice gifts, along with all your holy sacrifices. I will accept you as fragrant incense. And when I bring you out from the nations and gather you from the countries, where you have been scattered, and I will, proved be, I will be proved holy through you in the sight of the nations. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the land I have sworn, had sworn with uplifted hands to give to your ancestors. So what did you see? What, what words stood out is like those related to relationship. One of the things I saw is that I will accept them. Now, once again, let's go back. Do you remember this idea that, that the, the warning was a gift and the consequence was a gift? Here's another aspect. They didn't earn this. He's drawing them back out in the wilderness and he will accept them. He will restore relationship despite the fact that their actions don't warrant it. Another one. I will accept you as fragrant incense. And finally, I want to show you that the gathering to you, but there's a specific aspect in 42. He says this, then you will know that I am the Lord. In the course of the entire book of Ezekiel, God says this specifically to the people of Judah 84 times. If you're looking for a repeated phrase, this is it. And if you want to look for the universal principle throughout Ezekiel, the main theme is that God wants to be known. But let me bring some clarity to you. When I say that God wants to be known, I don't mean that he wants you to have a lot of information about him. He wants to be connected to you. He wants you to know him experientially, not intellectually. Intellect is part of it, but if you spend your whole life learning more trivia facts of the Bible and don't fall in love with the God of the Bible, you'll miss everything. Simply gathering facts is not the same thing as knowing. You know me and I know you. It's the difference of when you're laying asleep on the couch and your little boy comes and pulls the pillow off your head that you had covering your head because it's a beautiful sunny day and you just wanted a little nap. And he says, Daddy. That's the heartbeat of connection. It's so different than just saying, I know you. 
I'm connected to you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. He spends the entire book training on this key part with this universal principle. I want you to know who I am. I am not a God off in the distance. I am right here. He is both transcendent and imminent. The two together. I'll tell you, when um, I was explaining to you earlier that I really think that reading Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Isaiah are very difficult books to read. I was with a couple friends of mine and we were sitting at Starbucks saying, do we really want to try and tackle these? We had been studying the Bible together for six months to a year. And we had come up with these three questions that really helped when we were looking at the New Testament. And the idea of leaning into these hard books, we said, I don't know. One of the things that we came around to is that we said, you know how we ask questions in the New Testament? We ask three questions. Who is God? Who am I? And what should I do? And when we asked those questions, it gave us a framework that when we read verses one through four, we could see where it fit a little better. Well, then we said, those questions don't work when you're reading Ezekiel. But what we want to give you today is we want to kind of challenge the way that you read the Bible when you're reading these more difficult books. When you're reading a prophet, we came up with four questions that we think will be effective in helping you read the Bible. Because when you're reading that first chapter, you can look at what fits where. So the first question that we have for you in this kind of challenge of a Bible study method that's different is who is God? I have never found a section of the Bible that this question was not a part of it. It'll say that he's sovereign. It'll tell you that he's a father. It'll tell you that he's gracious. It'll tell you that he cares about you and wants to be known. It'll tell you that he has spoken, that he cares enough to give the warning. Who is God? Isn't it a cool thought that when you're reading the Bible and you start answering just this question, you're starting to paint a picture of who God is. It's if you come in with no perspective on who God is, and then you begin to read, and it says that he loves you in this way, and that he's a father, and that he's giving, that he's gracious, that he's holy, and that he's perfect, and you start to see him differently, it will transform your life and your connection with him. Not as information, but as relationship. First, who is God? And then because this is a prophet, and there is a problem, the second question is, what is the sin? What is the sin? What did they do? Remember in chapter 20, it was two issues. Do you remember them? I just spoke on them. Please tell me you remember. Just help me out. Number one was what? Idols. Idols. Number two was? Sabbath. Sabbath. Thank you. I feel so much better. What was the sin? Because it'll tell you what the problem was. And then what the, the last thing obviously is going to be, what is the consequence? But I want you to have one more on there. I also want you to look at what was the response. Because sometimes, and it's not always, and it's not even often, but sometimes the people turn and change. What does it look like when we have a life trajectory that is trusting in the idol, that is trusting in the idol, that is unwilling to set aside the time to be a part of connection with God? What happens when trust is broken but then we hear it and we're convicted and we realize something has to change and we're willing to say, God, change that in me. I want to I wanna pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you want to be known. That you and your perfection and you and all of your glory and who you are, you want to show that to us. That personally, you want to show it to me. God, I pray for those who right now are struggling with the idea of trusting you with their money. The idea that they would rather take, take money and say that that's what's going to save me and not trust you. God, I pray that you would help us, and I'm in that boat too, help us trust you. And God, I pray for those of us who are really wrestling with this idea of Sabbath and the idea of not just rest, but the idea of worship, that you matter most. And then I trust you with my time, I trust you with my money, and in the process of that, I want to worship you and I want to put my focus on you. God, I pray for those of us who are living in sin. And right now, I pray that you would speak with power into our hearts, that you would transform us. Give us a humble heart to hear the warning and before the consequence to be willing to turn. God, call us to you. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. 
And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.